and good evening, uh, good afternoon to our distinguished speakers, chairs in different parts of the world. And this is the fifth session in our anniversary edition of webinars. And we have two great speakers with us who are going to enlighten us through their lectures. The first speaker for today is a stalwart of endoscopic surgery in the world. And it is my great honor and privilege to introduce you to Professor Andrew Schroeder. Professor Schroeder is the president of the International Federation of Neuroendoscopy. And he currently serves as the chairman of the Department of Neurosurgery at the University of Medicine in Greifswald in Germany. Professor Schroeder is a pioneer in neuroendoscopic techniques with over 20 years of experience in surgery, both within the brain for the diseases like hydrocephalus, colitis, tumors, and outside the brain for pure endoscopic and endoscopic assisted skull based surgery. Professor Schroeder was the chairman of the Neuroendoscopy Committee of the WFNS from 2014 to 17. He has published several articles in various leading journals and he is an invited faculty at the various workshops conducted world over by various neurosurgical societies. It is our great honor to have him today as a speaker for our webinars. Today he is going to talk about endoscopic assisted transcranial skull based surgery. The second speaker for today is no stranger to us. He is among the world leaders of neuroendoscopy in the modern world. And it's a great honor to introduce you to Professor Paul Gardner. Professor Gardner is a Peter J. Janeta Professor, Executive Vice Director of Surgical Services, Neurosurgical Director, Center for Cranial Based Surgery, and Director of Surgical Neuroanatomy Lab at the Pittsburgh University, USA. Professor Gardner is a leading scholar, and his academic work translate into several articles in various leading journals and book chapters. He is a co-author of the most famous book in neurosurgery titled Skull Based Surgery, part of the master technique in otolaryngeology, head and neck surgery published by Walter Kluwers. His research works have redefined the boundaries of endoscopic endonasal brain surgeries. We are extremely honored to have him as a speaker at our webinars today. He is going to talk about endoscopic endonasal extended middle fossa approach. The chair for the first session of today is a legend in the field of skull based surgery from Japan, Professor Kenji Ohata. Professor Ohata is the honorary professor and specially appointed professor at the Department of Neurosurgery, Osaka City University Faculty of Medicine, Japan. He was the past president of the International Meningioma Society and an active member of the Japanese Neurosurgical Society. He is an invited faculty for several workshops and conferences organized by various international societies around the world. He is the author of more than 300 publications and several book chapters. We are extremely honored and thankful to Professor Ohata for accepting our invitation to chair the first session of today's webinar. The chair for the second session of today's webinar is another Salvat in the field of neuroendoscopy, Professor Luigi Maria Cavallo. Professor Cavallo is the Associate Professor of Neurosurgery at the Federico II University Hospital in Naples. He has performed more than 1,500 endoscopic endonasal transpinoidal pituitary surgeries and more than 500 endoscopic endonasal skull-based surgeries for different intracranial lesions, including craniopharyngiomas, meningiomas, clavial chordomas, and other rare tumors. Besides this, he has performed as a first or second surgeon more than 900 neurosurgical procedures on the main pathology of surgical interest of the central and peripheral nervous system. He has been an author of more than 200 publications and 32 book chapters. He has been an invited lecturer in more than 80 occasions in various international courses, meetings, and conferences. We are extremely honored and thankful to him for accepting our invitation to chair the second session of today's webinar. A special welcome to Dr. Sachin Chimate, who is a junior consultant in neurosurgery at the Apollo Hospitals, Chennai, India. He is our special co-host for today's webinar. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Professor Yoko Kato, I would like to sincerely welcome everybody to this online platform of ACNS webinars. Dr. Liu Boon Singh from Malaysia is my regular co-host for today. And with that introduction, I would like to hand over this platform to Professor Kenji Ohata. Okay, I want to show a few slides before I talk of the Professor Schroeder. Okay, so this is, uh, I want to show some slide which I presented, presented in the Japanese Neurosurgery Congress organized last month. So title of talk of, of development and future of skull based surgery. So there are so many distinct element technology for skull based surgery. Important de uh, uh, development of optical technology, optical technology nowadays Master slave robotic maybe will be available and the surgeon skill and the strategy and information integration, skull based anatomy, uh, skills and the simulation system, health economics, internet of things, material engineering, fish engineering, uh, surgical instrument and AI technologies. So optical technology, one of the, the, the important issue for the development of the skull based surgery. I review the history of the skull base surgery. So skull base surgery, concept of the skull base surgery already started 
at the late 19th century. This is a subtemporal approach which reported by uh, Katong and Hosley in 1983 and 1996. Uh, and then a concept of the endoscope already de developed late 19th century. It's very, very surprising. And then it's followed by the uh, endoscopic uh, subrabial transparent approach in 1910 and the endonasal transparent approach in, nine, in the same, same, same period. And uh, this is surprisingly, you know, front orbital approach is uh, reported 1912 and 1913. It's uh, nearly 100 uh, no, two, 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 200 years ago. Very, very surprising. Now, and then the middle of the, the, the 20th century, operating microscope used, and then scar concept of the scalpel surgery actually uh, developed in the 1970s. This is a uh, orbitosegmatic approach. And on the contrary, minimally invasive scalpel surgery and his concept is uh, popularized by Professor Pernetsuki. He was among of my friend, a uh, friend. And then, of course, there is an endoscope is used by ENG surgeon and uh, first endoscopy assisted neurosurgery reported by Professor Puzo in 1977. And important report is uh, my, my, one of my friend, Professor Joe, who the endoscopic approach reported and extended endoscopy approach presented by Professor Kassam. So we have a lot of information nowadays. The question is which strategy is appropriate in the visual case. I'm looking forward to having a lecture from Professor Hendy Shroida. So Professor Shroida, please. Yes, yeah, thank you for the kind introduction, Professor Ohada. Thanks for the invitation to the ACNS, to Dr. Raya and Yoko. It's a great pleasure to be here. And my talk should be about endoscope assisted uh, skull based surgery. And I selected to talk just uh, about the endoscope assisted skull based surgery in the posterior fossa because it's such a, such a great field that I think we cannot cover everything. And I just want to show you where I found the use of the endoscope uh, very helpful in these um, frequently very deadly dedicated surgeries. So I was consulted to call starts and not anymore because they don't have any contracts with uh, consultants so far. What is the concept of endoscope assisted microsurgery? That's very easy. It is simply the use of the microscope and the endoscope together in one surgery. And the problem with the microscope is if you have small keyhole approaches, you lose a lot of light already at the entrance into the cavity and you have a very small uh, area of view. So the field of view is very limited and you have only the view in straight line. And if you work in this light beam, you have a, a very poor illumination in the depths. That is a problem with the microscope. It's ideal for superficial structures, binocular view, very good uh, resolution because the lens system is very large in the microscope. But if you work in the depths, that is a problem. And that is a, the time when I use the endoscope. So you know, there are several reports showing that we use the endoscope from the beginning to remove, let's say a tumor at the petrous bone or even uh, smaller tumors. And then I always ask myself, what is really the advantage compared to the microscope? So I use the endoscope only if I cannot look well with the microscope, if I want to look around the corner if I need a wide angle of view and narrow corridors, that's why for endonasal surgery, the endoscope, in my opinion, is a must. And also in skull base surgery, if I want to look here behind the tuberculum cellae, I can take a 45 degree to look around the bony corner. And that's why the combination of microscope and endoscope, in my opinion, is the best solution because both optical instruments have advantages and disadvantages. I use rod lens. Um, Hopkin, Hopkin Opkis with a diameter of 2.7 millimeters, different angles of view. So you can look to any corner you want. And then of course you need angulated instrumentation when you want to remove a tumor, which is only visible under the angulated en endoscope. And I still 
found the HD camera image one the best. I have seen a lot of cameras. I have also tested 4K camera. And at least to me, when I look at the screen, there's no big difference in resolution if you look at the 26 inch screen for surgery when you compare HD and 4K. If you have a large screen, we have for our students a 86 inch screen, then you see a little bit difference, but otherwise I think image one HD camera is still very good. And you see here, this was a craniofine Joma case with a normal HD camera, and you can even see the erythrocytes running through the vessels. So the optical resolution of these endoscopes and the HD camera is really amazing. And some people say when you use an endoscope, you are one-handed and one-eyed surgeon. That is not good, but it's not true. You can fix the endoscope with a mechanical holding arm. Then you have both hands free for bimanual dissection, the same as we do it under the microscope. When you have the microscopic view, the advantage is even if you work in the depths that you see the superficial structures. In the depths, you don't see very well, but you always have a imagination where are the structures in front of you and if you touch it with the shaft of your instruments you see it it's not a blind corner if you have an endoscope as long as you are in front of the structures with your lens it's good but if you pass your lens here in between the nerves and you work in the work in the depths you have a perfect illumination here but you don't know what you do with the shaft of your instruments and that is a the dangerous Part of the procedure, you can move your instruments too much and touch the nerves, and then you can create a damage. This you have to keep in mind. Here you, you see, we go down here. There is a small lesion here on the other side of the clivus from the epidermoid tumor. When I try to dissect it here with a microscope, you see all the structures are in my way. I don't see very well, but I know when I touch the nerves with the instruments. And here, with an endoscope, I can resect very nicely because I have a perfect view, but I have to be very careful with the shaft of my instruments because I don't see it. And the next problem with the endoscope is that you have a heat generation. It's called cold light fountain, but you know the tip of the endoscope may become very hot. So you should not place the endoscope in front of a nerve for a long time without irrigation, then you may get a thermal damage of the nerve. Should we do pure endoscopic surgery? I think it makes no sense when I have an epidermoid like this one to use an endoscope. I have here my microscope. I have a perfect view. I have the small perforators which are attached to the tumor and I can dissect it very delicately with both hands. And I don't see any advantage to use the endoscope in this point because the endoscope has really not a better visualization. On the other hand, it may have a worse uh, uh, visualization. So if it's a superficial structure, which I can see very nicely with a microscope, I use a microscope. However, in this case, the tumor is hidden below seven and eight and is extending into the internal ordinary canal. In this case, I use my 30 degree endoscope and I look below seven and eight, and I can remove the tumor under direct visualization from the internal origin canal. And then of course the endoscope is very useful because when I have a microscope, I cannot see this area. 3D endoscopes, I have tested several of them. And I think you have a nice image for teaching, for the students is nice, but the practical work, it's not very good because when you touch with a lens and one lens is becomes dirty, you always switch between 3D and 2D endoscopy. So I don't like it. I have also tested an exoscope, different kinds from different companies. Olympus has one, Esculap has one, but I think it is still, it is still not, not a very, very good in the resolution. And many of my um, uh, residents say that it become headache. So I'm still not convinced. I'm still old fashioned and prefer the microscope and combine it with the endoscope. But I think in the future with the technique becomes better and better, of course, we will replace the microscope. So the surgical technique of endoscope assistance is that we start with the microscope. We make our surgery as usual. Then I use the endoscope frequently freehand just for inspection. And then when I have a delicate by manual dissection, I fix the endoscope with this mechanical holding device and then I have both hands and I have the same dissection what we have uh, with the microscope. 
that's very important that you don't pull with one hand, but you have really by manual dissection. So a good example are vestibular schwannomas, especially when they go into the fundus and the patient has still a serviceable hearing, as a good hearing. If I want to preserve the hearing, I have to be careful with the drilling. We usually use the supine position. Then there's a markation of the sigmoid sinus, transverse sinus, and we make uh, this incision behind the ear. We tilt the whole table and we tilt the head. So the gravity helps in retracting the uh, cerebellar surface. So I don't need any retractor to, to, uh, to retract the cerebellar. Monitoring, of course, is a must. We have all the channels, what we need, acoustic work potentials, facial monitoring. And then we make a small middle retrosigmoid approach. It's around two centimeters in size. It's very important that you expose the margin of the sigmoid sinus that you have an incision very close to the sinus. This avoids retraction. Some people don't dare to, to expose the sinus and then they have the bony margin here and then you have to retract too much. So it's very important. And we have uh, uh, developed a suction spatula. I find it very nice because you bring it at the lowest point of your surgical field. And then you can do the surgery as a surgery with two four steps on the continuous irrigation. I think continuous irrigation vestibular schwannomas, for me, it's very important because you have a very good view. All the blood is removed. Sami is proposing is that since several years, that's why he's using the sitting position, but with the suction spatula, you have the same effect that the irrigation fluid is removed from the field by the suction. And I can dissect with both hands without needing to use um, a suction device. So an example is, this is a 20 year old male and he had a hearing loss on the right ear. And that's why he underwent imaging and they found a tumor on the left side in the fundus. And then of course, people advised him to make radiation therapy, gamma knife, but he's a young guy. And you see, is this his only good hearing ear because he had the ear problem on the other side. When you look to the literature, and uh, look at the outcome of hearing preservation after a long time, you see after 15 years or 10 years, it's just one third of the patients. So that's why I think surgery is still a, a valuable option. So I, I explained everything to him and he agreed that we make the surgery. And you see here, this is a, a posterior wall of the internal auditory canal and you have to drill it, but you cannot drill too much if you open the posterior semicircular canal or the vestibule, there's a risk of hearing loss, of course. And even if you have drilled here, there's a blind cone in this area and that is a time when we use the endoscope. You see the tumor is exposed, the internal canal is drilled a little bit and then we dissect the tumor. The middle part of the tumor is removed under the microscope. That is not a big problem. And then now we have the tumor which is hidden in the, in the funders. Of course, you can make a blind curentage, but I think it's better you take an endoscope with 30 degree angle of view. And then <clears throat> under direct visualization, we can remove this tumor from the fundus. And I think this helps very much to get a gross total resection because with a microscope, you cannot see this area and you will probably miss some of the tumor. But here with a 30 degree, and this is a 45 degree endoscopic view, you see they are just the residual vestibular fibers, but there is no tumor. You see the amount of drilling. I could have drilled a little bit more, but to be on the safe side, I did not. And you see very good hearing preservation. And he's now five years out of surgery and has still a very good, good hearing. <clears throat> when we have larger tumors like these, with a good hearing still on the right ear was a young girl, we make a sitting position because a suction spatula will not work in this large tumors. So then the incision is of course a little bit larger larger craniotomy, 
And then also we open the canal, all is done under the microscope. The disadvantage is we need some retraction to the cerebellum with this approach. And then we look for the nerves with a stimulator. So the nerve is not here. Then we coagulate the, the tumor surface and we make a vigorous debulking of the tumor with ultrasonic aspiration, take histology specimens. And then this is the, this is the uh, most important point. You have to find the ideal plane to dissect so that you can remove all the nerves from the sh shiny surface of the tumor. This is the tumor which extended into the canal. Facial nerve is verified. And then tumor is removed with by manual dissection. So we keep the tumor and then you have the here is this, uh, the vestibular, as uh, a cochlear nerve, vestibular nerves, which are dissected at the lower pole of the tumor. And then we come to the upper pole where we find then the facial nerve. But you see, because of this irrigation, even if the tumor is very bloody, you can always keep a good field. And that, that is very important. You see, here is now the facial nerve coming, irrigation, all the time irrigation, two hand technique. And then you can dissect the tumor. This is a facial nerve running here. And in this case, we were lucky. We had a good plane. We had no bad prognostic trains in the monitoring. And we could remove the tumor from the, from the brainstem completely in this girl. This is after the one day after surgery. You see, she has a little bit weakness, but not much. And after two months, it was completely gone. But if there is some tumor remnant, very sticky to the facial nerve, then I would leave a small layer of the capsule to the tumor. So I would not risk to get the facial palsy. That is my policy has changed when I was young. My, my doctor said, vestibular schonoma is always to be taken completely. But I think function is most important. Another good indication of endoscope assistance are epidermoid tumors. That is a lady 32, year, 32 years old. She had already two surgeries and hearing loss after the first surgery. And there was still tumor, which could not be removed from the microscopic approach because the tumor was indenting the cerebellar peduncle. And when they came from here, from the infratentorial supracerebellar approach, you have here a blind angle which they could not see. So it's a superior retrosigmoid approach. And you see, this is a tumor very sticky to the tent. So my first question was here, where is the trochlear nerve? And with a microscope, I cannot see it. So I use a 30 degree endoscope to look for the third nerve because that is uh, for the fourth nerve. The fourth nerve is at risk. And you see here is a tent. Here's the fourth nerve coming. And then it's running here on the undersurface of the tumor close to the brainstem. So it's not pushed upwards, but it pushed down. So with this knowledge in my mind, I can have a vigorous debulking at the edge of the tent because I know the nerve is not there. So all the tumor is removed under the microscope. It's no problem, it's not a bloody tumor. Then we come to the posterior part of the tumor. And here you see identification of the trochlear nerve is running here under the surface. And then although it was a recurrent tumor, it was a good plane for dissection between the capsule and the brain stem. If the capsule is very attached in epidermoids, sometimes it's better you leave a piece of the capsule behind before you risk a brain stem infarction or the nerve palsy. But in this case, although it was a recurrent case, there was a good plane to dissect. And now you see that is a tumor which is indenting the cerebellar peduncle. And it's, this cannot be seen under the microscope. That's why I use a 45 degree endoscope, a curved suction and a curved curette and get a gross total resection of this part as well. And this cannot be seen with a microscope. It's no chance. So you will not see it and you will not dissect it. That's why the use of the endoscope is crucial to get here a very good resection of the tumor in this place. This is a final inspection. Here again, trochlear nerve, brainstem, no obvious tumor remnant. And you see, this is three months after surgery, the indentation. 
it's completely gone and she is now out of the surgery for six years and no recurrence so far. So in epidermoids, as the endoscope is really of utmost importance to get a gross total resection from a small craniotomy. There's another case of 54 year old female. She presented with facial numbness and she has this tumor extending from the CP angle into Meckel's cave enormous enlargement of Meckel's cave. So it's a slow growing lesion. From the density, you see it's a little bit hyper intensity in T1. So it should be not an epidermoid, but a dermoid. And then the question is, what is the best approach? Some people say, yes, you make a retrosigmoid approach. Some people say, no, you make uh, an anterior approach, endonasal or subtemporal or combined. But I think the most problematic case is here the compression at the CP angle. That's why we make a simple retrosigmoid approach. We open the arachnoid. You see some hair is here. Sometimes you fin find, can find some teeth. That's all removed under the microscope. Here you see seven and eight nerve. Try to dissect the capsule with a bimanual traction to counter traction technique. <clears throat> this is a trough layer nerve. It's dissected from the tumor. And then you see this is a paper thin trigeminal nerve. And this is very sticky when it comes to the Meckel's caves. That's why I stopped the resection of the capsule because you will kill the nerve and we want to have a good function. That's why we just take the content which is compressing the nerve from the Meckel's cave, but we don't make any attempt to resect the tumor. And you see with the microscope, I cannot see very well. So I move to a 45 degree endoscope and now I have a perfect view into Meckel's cave and with different angles of view curettes and suction, I remove this tumor. So the content is completely removed. Finally, irrigation to remove the last pieces and to avoid the back uh, chemical meningitis. Of course, the capsule of the tumor is there, but if you remove it, you will destroy the nerve. You see complete evacuation of the tumor and she is doing fine and the facial numbness resolved slowly. So another patient with um, a history of progressive gait and balance problems and she had a dysesthesia in the left arm. An MRI shows a foramen magnum tumor. The tumor goes more to the left side than to the right side. If the tumor is shifting the brainstem away, you can make a midline approach. But when the tumor is so far covered, I would not come from midline. I make a far lateral approach to avoid retraction. And this is what you see. You see here is the spinal accessory nerve, dental ligaments, and uh, this is C2 nerve. It's mainly um, sensible fibers. So we dissect under the microscope. Tumor is debulked then mobilized and removed. And you see the problem is, is a tumor which is ventrally located. I cannot see it because I never drill the, the condyle away. I only drill to the posterior part of the condyle and then I use here a 30 degree endoscope and you see how nicely I can see all the tumor remnant. I remove the tumor together with the inner layer of the dura. I just leave the periosteal layer and I can get a gross total resection the tumor bed is then coagulated and I can nicely see it with the endoscope. So I don't need to drill more of the skull base to get a gross total resection. You see, this is amount of drilling. I always stop behind the, uh, the condyle. Some people make a partial resection of the condyle, but I don't do that. I always look with the endoscope in this area. And this is the MRI after three months shows um, gross total resection, so far no recurrence. So another tumor, jugular tubercle, meningioma. Same thing, blind corner is behind the jugular tubercle. And you see with an endoscope, I can look down to the, um, to the uh, hypoglossal canal and I can remove the tumor piece, which is close to the nerve under endoscopic visualization and I have a very good resection of the tumor. I just left a little bit tumor, which is extending into the canal <clears throat> to avoid the damage to the nerves. And finally, a case of an 18 year old female. She had multiple problems from the brainstem, facial palsy, double vision, hemiparesis. 
And MRI shows a large pontine carvanoma. So the question is where to go, which approach, subtemporal and nonasal, or simply retrosick. Of course, we have to enter here into the uh, brain stem, but the selection of the approach was to go through the cerebellopontine fissure to come over the middle peduncle into the cavernoma. So retrosigmoid approach was chosen. You see, we are here uh, on the left side, the seven and eight, here's a pontine area. So I open, I open the uh, fissure a little bit to get access to the middle cerebellar peduncle. And then I enter it under navigation guidance to come into the brain stem. And then you find the typical hemorrhage from the cavernoma and the cavernoma is removed step by step. You see there's normal, normal brain tissue. It's very important that you try to keep the, the gliotic plane, but this, this uh, cavernoma was ruptured and was also go to the brain tissue. And this is now I take an endoscope to check the cavity to make sure there is no remnant. You see the trigeminal nerve, this is facial nerve, and you see the brainstem is relaxed now. And this is, the, this is our approach from through the peduncle into the cavernoma. And this was a lady of one week before discharge. And I met her last year, no, no, no in, in 2019, when we went for skiing to Italy, she, I met her at the Petra station and she was going for snowboarding. So I think it's a good sign that her balance and so is, is okay. So one example for aneurysm clipping. If you have an aneurysm in the posterior cranial fossa, then the aneurysm helps also to look around. This was a lady, she has here balance problems. You see edema in the brainstem. And um, the radiologists say we cannot coil it because it has a broad base and an acute angle of the pica so I think clipping of this aneurysm, this direction would be the best choice. And here I did not select the midline approach suboccipital, what maybe what a mistake, but I came from a from a far letter, uh, from an inferior retrosic approach. And you see, I have to use an endoscope to have an overlook over the anatomy. You see this is a vertebral, this is a pica, and this is an aneurysm. I want to see what is the relation to the perforators, and I went in behind here and I see this is the aneurysm and the perforators are here. Then I tried to clip the aneurysm under endoscopic visualization, but when the endoscope was in the surgical field, I could not come in with my clip applier. So I have to switch back to the microscope. I mobilized the neck from the brain stem <clears throat> because the aneurysm was pointing to the brain stem and makes this edema and that's why she had the balance problems. And then I clip the aneurysm so tra trajectory was good for clipping from this approach, but the overview over the anatomy is not so good. Maybe the suboccipital midline approach would have been better, but I clipped it here from this approach. And then I don't know if the aneurysm clipped or not, and I could not see it with a microscope. So I take a 30 degree endoscope, go in again, and you see the aneurysm clip closes the aneurysm, but the perforator is not in the clip. And that is the most important information what you want to get. And you see a very nice clipping and she is, was improving with her balance problems. I would just tell you trigeminal rigor is also an option with the superior retrosigmoid approach. And especially if you have here a very prominent supramerital tubercle, the endoscope makes sense. You see with a microscope, I just see the root of the trigeminal nerve, but I don't see what is in the entrance to Meckel's cave. And then I have to drill all this to see it, or I take a 30 degree endoscope and you see, I see nicely, this is a vein. And then we coagulated the vein under, under endoscopic view. So I will skip this because this takes too long. And I will show you the hemifacial spasm. This is also a very good indication for, for, for the use of the endoscope. 
because in, in, in the trigeminal neuralgia, it's usually easy to see the compression, but hemifacial spasm, the compression is down in the sulcus. The approach is different. This is a lower rate of sigmoid approach. Monitoring is placed, of course, to, to make the recording of the lateral spreads, which is a good uh, indication that you have good oppression. This is small craniotomy, just in the lower part. And you see there's not much space. If I place my endoscope from the beginning here inside, I cannot move my instrument. So I, I, again, I don't think that the pure endoscopic decompression is the best choice. I start with a microscope and then I come with the endoscope. You see with a, with a microscope, you see here's the facial nerve, here's the vessel, but you cannot see very well. And now we have a 45 degree endoscope and you see so nice. This is a basilar. Here's the common trunk coming around the uh, pontomedary sulcus. And this is a ICA loop, is a pica loop, and this is a facial nerve. So you have a much better view to this area with an endoscope. And then I switch back to the microscope in most cases and I fix here the, the Teflon in. And then again, I take the, my, uh, the endoscope to check the position. I think this is really very, very helpful because you can see much better the compression. And just one case, cold technique, sometimes the compression is very far medially and it's very difficult to see that. And then I use the endoscope for decompression also. You see, there is a loop going far into the brain stem, far up. This is a pica loop coming in here. And when you want to see it, you, you, you need an endoscope. This is with a microscope. I try to see the compression, but I retract already a lot. The acoustic work potentials become worse. I can still not see the compression because so far up. And now I take a 45 degree endoscope. You see, this is the vertebral. This is the origin of pica, and this is a loop. And here's the facial nerve. So it is directly pointing to the facial nerve at the level of the, of the sulcus. And now I have my dissector and the suction and under endoscopic view, I mobilize the vessel out from this compression site. This is very difficult under the microscope because the angle of view is not good and you have to retract too much. So this is a, this is a final, final message. I want to, to, to tell you that there is um, a lot of um, retraction sometimes necessary. My conclusion is that the endoscope assisted technique is very helpful in microvascular decompression, especially hemifacial spasm for vestibular schwannomas, which extend to the fundus, but also to epidermoids. It's very nice because the epidermoid goes to any corner of the subarachnoid space. And the conclusion is that it's the endoscope is a valuable adjunct to microsurgery. It enables looking around the corner. It reduces retraction and reduces drilling of the skull base. And I hope I can welcome you next year with our continuous Baltic Sea endoscopy course and we can have a lot of fun and a lot of good German beer. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Schroeder, so for your beautiful operation. You focus on the CPNG tumor surgery with endoscope assisted technique. So uh, as you mentioned, I have uh, some question. As you mentioned, it's so interesting thing is you compare the high definition camera and 4K camera, you said there's no difference. You love to use a uh, HD camera. I like your comment. And my next uh, uh, question is, uh, many people concerned about the injury of the cranial nerve or important structures by the shaft of the instrument because we cannot see the shaft under the, the endoscope. Would you talk about your concept, how to uh, avoid such kind of injury? Would you introduce your technique or just? Yeah. So if you have a vestibular schwannoma, you stay always in front of the nerves. That is no problem. But if you have an epidermoid and you go in the depths down, then of course you have to very be very careful. And one solution would be that you place an exoscope in front mm -hmm. and you have one screen, you see the image of your exoscope, where is the relation of the instrument to the nerves and you have an endoscopic view down what you are doing in the depths. I have tried it several times, but it's a little bit bulky. So it's, 
if you have too much in your fr in front of your uh, view, then it's difficult to manipulate in the right way. So now I just look a little bit when I introduce my instrument along the shaft of my endoscope into the field. So I don't use a microscope, bring the endoscope in, and then I change my view. I take the microscope from the beginning away. I take my endoscope and I look where I go. And then I bring my instrument together with the, um, with the endoscope in the depths and I dissect. When I fix my endoscope, of course, you have not this movement and then you have to be very careful. So we have all the nerves monitored. When I touch one nerve, I will have immediate response in the monitoring. But of course, you have to have a very coaxial working with your instruments when you cross the nerve. Mm -hmm. That is, that is really a problem. That's why I mentioned it. You have to be very careful. And additionally, you have to be careful because of the heat of the tip. So I just okay. look around as a shaft of my instruments. That is what I do. Okay, thank you very much. My next question is, in the endoscope and nasal approach, in my institute, assistant holds the endoscope and they, they move, he, he moves the endoscope to show us the 3D images. In the CP angle tumor surgery, it's so dangerous to ask the assistant to move the endoscope. That is why you fix the endoscope. Is this correct? Exactly. Exactly. That is the reason. Yes. For a frontal skull base, I did already that my assistant is holding the scope when we resect the tumor from the frontal skull base to look behind the uh, jugular tuberculosis. So, but in the CP angle, there's so many nerves, I, I, I really will give, get nervous when the assistant is holding it, especially you don't know which res which resident is coming with you, <laughs> that I think is too risky. Okay, and I like your suction spatula. It's so interesting. It's a, it's a German, German instrument. Yes, it's from yes. Finn Company. You okay. can buy it's it. A, okay, thank you very much. <laughs> it's so interesting. I like it very much because it really, it gives you a free hand. I don't need a suction. I just dissect and I always want to have this clear plane so I don't want any erythrocyte in my surgical field. So he can irrigate, irrigate, and all the blood is washed away. And then you can dissect very nicely. This is really the advantage what you have with a sitting position. You can get with a suction spatula, but only for the small tumors, only okay. if they are intramatal tumors. So I want to ask the question from the audience. We can definitely take one or two comments as our second speaker has already okay, allowed. Okay, all right, all right. Yes, Professor Atul Gail, short comments from you. Yeah, Henry, that was a great presentation, no question. You see, what you have done is you have, uh, with your expertise in endoscope, you have tried to widen the horizons of use of endoscope during posterior fossa surgery. The, and I completely agree when you talk about use of endoscope with uh, for treatment of uh, epidermal epidermal and take the endoscope right up so endoscopes and i also agree with you that endoscope might just be a very good tool for microvascular decompression but my only worry is you know we should not fall in prey of you know cluttering the field with too many instruments you know endoscope when it is not necessary, you are using, of course, you are, I'm not trying to say you should not use. And you are, of course, very, I have seen you operating with the endoscope. I know your level of, you know, technical skills. But the thing is, many of these acoustics, for instance, the, I don't see real indication for use of endoscope. Maybe it is not useful at all for me. But it, if it is for others, I don't uh, have any for cavernous cavernomas inside the uh, brainstem, I don't really see the indication of introducing the endoscope and then cluttering your field with the instruments. So this is my, but what you have shown is to use it as an additional tool, use it as an additional hand and use it when it is necessary. I completely agree that it is one additional tool and one additional armamentarium in your hand and to use it the way you want. Henry, thank you for a very nice, very nice images you showed, good videos, and thank you very much, Henry. Thank you, too, for your nice comment. And I agree, sometimes we use the endoscope where it is maybe not be necessary, but you know, we have it always on the table that all my assistants are very, very easy to use it. And in the Cavanoma, it's all right. I have seen it with the endoscope, uh, but before with a microscope that there is probably no tumor that I, I agree with you completely. 
And I also agree that the combination of endoscope and microscope is very helpful. Some people make everything now with the endoscope. And I have seen really nice images of pineal tumor surgery from a Chinese guy. It was really perfect images. And then he said it's a minimally evasion tick. And then he moved the endoscope out and you have seen that he makes such a bilateral craniotomy over all the transverse sinus and really a big hole just because you can move then the endoscope freely. When we make pineal tumors lesions, we make a small two centimeter paramedian exposure. And when you bring the endoscope in, you cannot move your instruments anymore. And that's why you have always to be a critical when, when you see the reports about endoscopic technique in my hand. You, I, I, I agree completely with you. The microscope is still a good tool. That's a great Please. talk. You address various pathologies like microvascular decompression for trigeminal neuralgia, hemifacial spasm. My question to you, you can do any pathology with that. But to my mind, supramiatal tubercle, uh, that is a very good indication. You also told that uh, you can see the position of uh, uh, Teflon correctly with the endoscope. You also told that the fundus of the internal auditory canal, you can, without blind dissection, you can remove. My one question to you, you are such a fantastic subject. You told that durability of gamma knife is not good for vestibular schwannoma. What is your take on, I, if you have a 2.5 centimeter vestibular schwannoma, totally asymptomatic, hearing normal, facial nerve normal, what do you do? You are such a good surgeon. It depends from the age of the patient. If the patient is 85, I would say go home, come back with a new MRI in one year. If it's a young patient, I would explain that I would recommend to do surgery. The best chance to preserve the hearing is when he has almost normal hearing. If he comes late and has already bad hearing, you know, usually the hearing is lost. So that I would explain to that and then the patient can choose. I, what I send for radiation is a growing tumor in an older patient. And I send a tumor which is close to the fundus where I know when I make a surgery, I, I probably will make him deaf for sure. Sometimes you see there's a small part of the tumor going to the cochlea. But on the other hand, if you send him to radiation and they have a high dose of radiation to the cochlea itself, and usually these patients become deaf after two, three or five years. So that's why uh, in most of these patients, I observe them. We can take one comment from Professor Deepujari, sir, who has joined us. Thank you, Professor Deepujari, for joining. I know we are uh, very short of time. My short question, uh, uh, Henry, uh, excellent talk with beautiful videos as usual. Uh, my only comment is, you know, when you are doing endonasal surgery, not only are you irrigating, but you are usually away from important uh, structures. You are only visualizing them. While doing this... Uh, CP angle surgery, you are, you know, going beyond the nerves, uh, going very close to brainstem, occasionally inside the brainstem, as we talked about in Pontine cavernoma. What do you think is the worry in terms of uh, heat generated by the endoscope light? Do you uh, find any changes uh, in electrophysiology while doing such uh, maneuvers? Uh, have you encountered any problems uh, due to heat production? No, that's what I mentioned. We always make constant irrigation. If I place my endoscope with a holder in front of the vestibular cochlear nerve to remove the tumor from the fundus, I have always irrigation for my assistant. And that's why it's difficult to say whether when you dissect, you know, sometimes you have changes in acoustic work potentials because, for your manipulation, because of your manipulations. If there is some part caused by the endoscope heat, I cannot say it to you. But I have never been, had never seen a big problem where I can say this was surely the heat of the endoscope because I bring it in for inspection only shortly or I always irrigate with, with saline because that is pretty clear. If you place it too long, you will have a problem. The nurse placed the endoscope on the, on the drape and there was a burned a hole in the, in the drape, so hot it was. So uh, that is why sure. this is a really, points which you have to keep in mind and you have to be very careful with that. It's no question. It's Thank different you. from the nose. The nose is easy. You will you irrigate, you have to, you are in distance away, but you CPA don't. close to the nerves. Thank you. Thank you so much. We Thanks. can go back to our chair for his concluding remarks.
Professor Ohata, your concluding comments. Yeah, thank you very much for the uh, uh, Professor Shiroza for your good uh, presentation. And I'm going to operate a small acoustic new room uh, next week. I'm going to use your technique. Thank you. Thank yeah, you very much. Fine. Please Thank try and let so me much. know whether it's good or not. <laughs> ah, my, 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 my last question, you, you use a 30 degree angled endoscope to remove the small tumor from the fundus. Yes, usually you start with 30 degrees and sometimes I take 45 if I want to look deeper down for okay. the final inspection is 45. And sometimes you can also take 45, but you know, your more degree of angulation you have, the more difficult is it to dissect. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. You just take Thank 30. you very much. It's time to close your talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so thank much for the invitation that. because I have to leave a little bit earlier. Paul, hi. Sorry, I cannot hear all your talk because later on I have another talk in Germany. Thanks for the invitation. It was a great pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank Bye. you so much, Professor. It was a wonderful talk. And thank you, Professor Ohata, for sharing. A warm welcome to the second speaker, Professor Paul Gardner. I would like to hand over this session to Professor Luigi Maria Cavallo to say a short introduction and invite Professor Paul Gardner for his lecture. Thank you. Uh, it's really a pleasure to me to introduce to you Paul Gardner. Everybody know you. Uh, you know Paul Gardner comes from uh, uh, University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. And uh, when you say UPMC, you, you say that uh, this is the, maybe the temple of uh, endoscopic and another approach to the skull base. And uh, when I name people like Hedon Joe, Rick Karawa, Minka Sam, all these pioneers come from that center. And Paul Gardner now is the chairman of the neurosurgical division uh, of neurosurgery over there. He's uh, continuing to rise the bar in these uh, skull base and another approaches. And uh, today he will share with us uh, the experience on uh, endoscopic and another approach to the middle cranial fossa. So it's really a pleasure for me to introduce to you um, Paul Gardner. Please, Paul, thanks for coming with us. Thank you, Luigi. Thank you for the, the kind words. Um, listening to you and having you introduce me uh, reminds me that I think my, my first international course was at uh, your center, I think 16, 17 years ago, uh, where we did a, a shared course. And I think that's where we first met. So it's great seeing you again. And uh, beautiful talk uh, by Dr. Schroeder. Um, I agree 100% with your usages, especially for hearing preservation and acoustics. I think it's very valuable to get the most complete resection. And for epidermoids, when we studied this, we found that we clearly got a more radical resection with epidermoids because they do go around corners and you have areas where there's residual that you don't even expect it to be. Um, I'm gonna talk about perhaps a, a somewhat controversial topic and that's uh, endoscopic endonasal approach to the middle fossa. So really extending well beyond uh, the typical uh, sagittal plane. Principles of any skull-based surgery, any surgery in general, there's an exposure, a resection and a reconstruction phase. Um, and the exposure for uh, these kind of approaches really uh, can be much different when you start extending beyond the sagittal plane. Our goals for exposure, though, always are to have bimanual dissection, so we can do the exact same resection we would do. We want to create a single cavity uh, that we're working through, regardless of which sinuses we use. And these are done in modules. Uh, we're all pretty comfortable with the sagittal plane, but I'll be talking more about the coronal plane, where we really extend off of midline. The cell, of course, is the center of our skull base universe, and that's where all of us started uh, our endoscopic experience. As we heard a superb lecture by Dr. Ahada, um, and I think that timeline that he drew out is, is very informative and, and very interesting, and really visualization has been the key for the advancing of skull base surgery. Um, but when we look, we can see the paracellar anatomy. We're all used to this. We learned that we cannot just expose the cella, but we can expose the paracellar region to gain access to the cavernous sinus. And this is all purely from a, a transphenoidal, a wide sphenoidotomy. But what do we do when we want to extend out to the middle fossa or even beyond? Well, this requires uh, bringing in the maxillary sinus. So we talk about doing antrostomies, which is a simple opening into the maxillary sinus, or even a complete 
medial maxillectomy, where we completely removed the medial wall of the, of the maxillary sinus. And depending on how much of the maxillary sinus we remove and how much we open, depends on how much access that we have. Uh, we can even extend this further by doing what's called a Danker's extension, where we remove the uh, buttress and gain access all the way to the anterior aspect of the medial max of the maxillary sinus, or what I probably prefer, which is a Caldwell lock, a simple sublabial incision. Here's the a Danker's access again by removing that buttress. You can get a little bit of of cosmetic effect from sinking of the nasal ala, uh, but this does give us the same access much more laterally. And the same thing, of course, for an anterior transmaxillary approach or a Caldwell luck. So this really allows us to get access all the way out to the infratemporal fossa and to the floor of the middle fossa. Uh, the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus is really our access. And here you can see after the, on the right side, after the maxillary sinus wall has been opened, we have a beautiful exposure of the pterygopalatine space. And understanding, be able to dissect the pterygopalatine space is critical for this approach. Here we can see the dissection through the pterygopalatine and identification of V2 or the infraorbital nerve as it comes out of frame and rotundum into the pterygopalatine. This is the main aspect that we don't want to injure to avoid morbidity to the patient. And here you can see the IMAX uh, really uh, completely filling the pterygopalatine. This can be mobilized or it can be sacrificed uh, in, er in order to gain further access into the middle fossa or the pterygoid region. We also uh, are very familiar now, most people with the Vidian nerve. Uh, it's interesting on our uh, written boards in the US now, there's a question about the Vidian nerve, which I think is a tribute to the impact that endonasal surgeries had within neurosurgery. But by sacrificing this Vidian nerve, we have a beautiful access now to the entire base of the pterygoid. So this base of the pterygoid really is the key to the middle fossa into Meckel's cave. Uh, here's an example of a lateral recess uh, meningoencephalocele doing uh, relatively simple cases like this with our ENT colleagues is really how we learned how to gain access to the middle fossa. Here's a, a video showing that. You can see this patient had a large septal perforation which was pre-existing. And again, this is a left-sided tumor, so we want to gain access not only to the sphenoid, but also to the maxillary sinus. So here you can see the sphenoidotomy being performed, and you can see the maxillary antrostomy. Now, the importance here is, again, we're going to make a single cavity. The sphenopalatine artery is sacrificed. We further open up uh, into the sphenoid and open up the pterygopalatine fossa by removing the bone on the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus. So now you can see how this is a single cavity that gives us access to this meningoencephalocele. Now to, to get access to the base of the pterygoid, you really do need to sacrifice the video. And this is a potential uh, downside to this if a patient has any uh, V1 dysfunction because then you'll get a dry and insensate eye. But in general, it's very well tolerated if the patient has normal or eye function preoperatively. So by dissecting and transecting the vidian, we now have beautiful access all the way out uh, to the very lateral recess. We can work under V2. These generally come just inferior and lateral to V2. So we can coagulate. Here you see rotundum coming in just above us. So working with an angled endoscope now and working under V2, you can see the typical situation with the meningoencephalocele where it's really a very small bony defect that has to be repaired once you reduce the meningoencephalocele. So you don't wanna just, just cover the meningoencephalocele, but you want to get to its very origin. Then a simple free mucosal graft is adequate for coverage. Some people use fat. Um, really many techniques are effective, but I think the free mucosal graft is the most natural and effective way. Here's some dural sealant being used, although we don't use this anymore. And then of course, it's important to evaluate a patient's uh, intracranial pressure uh, with a spontaneous meningoencephalocele. And here we see the closure. But this is essentially how we learn to gain access to the middle fossa and that we could get access to the middle fossa. Uh, we then started extending more lateral out to Meckel's cave, uh, just lateral to the cavernous sinus. And here you can see on the right side, uh, by drilling out the pterygoid, sacrificing the vidian, we can get access to V2 and V3 and, and what's been called the front door of Meckel's cave. Here's a great example of what uh, we thought was a schwannoma, but turned out to be uh, a clear cell meningioma. Uh, you can see the tumor extending through Meckel's cave into the posterior fossa. I won't spend as much time on the exposure here, but of course we do a right-sided flap. 
and then a left-sided maxillary antrostomy. There you can see that sphenopalatine artery being sacrificed. Here's our sphenoidotomy and maxillary antrostomy being done. So again, we create that large single corridor exposing the uh, pterygoid wedge. Remember the pterygoid wedge is a great landmark for the paraclival carotid artery. And then sacrificing the sphenopalatine artery, I'm sorry, the palatosphenoidal artery there, that can be a good landmark to find the vidian. And then we drill out around the vidian. And I've found that if I want to access Meckel's cave, I have no choice but to sacrifice the vidian. If I don't, the vidian or the bone behind the pterygoid pushes me up toward the lateral cavernous sinus rather than down towards Meckel's cave. So here's that widening into a single cavity. And then simply by going directly posteriorly, now I have access through the maxillary sinus into Meckel's cave. We can see the pituitary and the cella, and I can do both a transpliable and a uh, trans pterygoid approach to gain access to Meckel's cave and the posterior fossa. Here's opening the posterior fossa dura. Encounter the tumor, I can internally debulk the tumor. And the nice thing about this is this showed me the relationship here, I can see the sixth nerve, but it showed me the relationship between the tumor and the fifth nerve. By doing that, I recognized that the fifth nerve was going to be deep and inferior to the tumor. And so I entered directly into Meckel's cave and I can preserve as many as possible of the trigeminal fibers within Meckel's cave because I'm landing directly on the tumor rather than having nerve between myself and the tumor. One of the difficulties with choosing an approach for a Meckel's cave tumor is it's hard to be certain if the nerves are medial or lateral. And of course, you want to choose your approach based on the relationship to the nerves. Here we see the trigeminal nerve sitting in the floor of Meckel's cave. So in this case, it was inferior and lateral. So this anterior approach was a beautiful approach to preserve the maximal trigeminal fibers possible. And then of course, a multilayer reconstruction, including nasal septal flap. And able to get a complete resection of this tumor. Um, even more common here, so actually here's um, less common rather, here's a, a case of a multiply recurrent meningioma. This is a woman who had multiple craniotomies and wanted to try to avoid further craniotomy. So here is sacrificing uh, the vidian nerve and then drilling out the entire floor of the middle fossa. And we can work on both sides of V3. And here's working on the medial aspect of the tumor extending into Meckel's cave and then working lateral to V3 to the tumor extending out towards the temporal lobe. We see temporal lobe coming into view. Here's our temporal lobe cleared out. And then essentially able to resect the tumor on both sides. Um, we sort of left a little bit of tumor extending up towards the sixth nerve to avoid any injury to sixth nerve, but able to get a very nice resection of this tumor, which uh, of course, since it was multiply recurrent, didn't end up needing more treatment. When we start extending down towards the infratemporal fossa, we have to add in this Caldwell lock. Here's a 87 year old woman who had this very large V3 schwannoma extending down into the infratemporal fossa. And so we simply did this all directly endoscopically through a Caldwell lock, through a direct uh, alisphenoid, trans alisphenoid going directly through the greater wing of the sphenoid, directly through this Caldwell lock and the posterior wall, the maxillary sinus. And you can see how this gave us a beautiful extradural access to this tumor, didn't require any craniotomy. For an 87 year old woman, we didn't want to resect all the way to the intracranial space. You can see V3 largely preserved posteriorly, and you can see the cuff of the tumor and dura superiorly. So we left this cuff, it relieved her symptoms. Uh, she was able to go home in two days and she sent me letters every year for about five years. We use it quite often for tumors like uh, uh, trigeminal schwannomas, or rather not quite often, it's not very common, but it's an excellent option for these. Here you can see our early series. And what's important here is that the vast majority of these involve Meckel's cave and V3 or the root uh, of the nerve in Meckel's cave. So we can access these directly posteriorly, but it's especially use useful for V3. It is not good for all uh, trigeminal schwannomas. This can, of course, be combined. Uh, we can do the anterior portion from an endonasal approach and the posterior portion through a retrosigmoid. I also like using a lateral orbitotomy for these now. Here you can see uh, able to get complete 82% uh, of patients got a gross total resection when that was the goal. 
And you can see here uh, other cases largely with near total resection, trying to leave uh, residual for preservation of function. Uh, very rare that we would cause any significant cranial neuropathy. Of course, you affect the trigeminal nerve when you operate on it. I think this is largely underreported in trigeminal uh, schwannomas. Um, but we had uh, uh, very rare uh, cranial neuropathies. We did have one patient with a partial third and sixth nerve, which improved that follow-up, but no new permanent cranial neuropathies. CSF leak here is very rare because we're able to fill Michael's cave with fat. Uh, and these essentially are not a very large defect that we're trying to cover. Of course, we have to be very careful. We're working around the carotid artery. Here's a case uh, um, of a tumor that wasn't clear to be uh, a trigeminal schwannoma, but turned out to be. And we had a very nice uh, dissection of the tumor, really no problems resecting the tumor. After uh, here, we can see the carotid artery, but you see that relationship directly with the carotid artery. So. Uh, biopsied the tumor, dissected the tumor, and then I came back in um, after we sent off pathology, and uh, unfortunately, a trainee had, uh, was testing the cartouche and had poked a hole in the carotid artery with the cartouche after we'd resected tumor. So the carotid artery is bare here. You do have to be able to control it. With some difficulty, we're able to get proximal and distal control. You can see the issue with uh, an endoscope anytime you're working with it. Obviously, uh, the endoscope can get slimed. The fortunate thing is this was on the front wall of the carotid artery, which is an unusual place to have an injury. And so I was able to use this 90 degree clip and just barely pinch off the front wall of the carotid artery. Able to preserve the vessel and resect at least all of the Meckel's cave portion of the tumor. Here you can see the artery postoperatively, just some very minor narrowing here where the clip is, but nice preservation of the artery itself. We did have two recurrences which required gamma knife, but no one with gross total resection had recurrence. So I do think this is effective for both uh, some middle fossa and trigeminal schwannomas, but you really have to be very selective. And really it's only B3 tumors extending down largely into the infratemporal fossa that I still use these for. As that case demonstrates, once we start extending into the coronal plane beyond the carotid artery, we have to be able and willing to deal with the carotid artery. There are really four different segments that are relevant for uh, medial or endonasal approaches. And these are my landmarks for them. The paraclinoid carotid artery is the medial optical carotid recess, really where the optic and the carotid come together. The foramen lacerum or anterior genu of the carotid, um, where it meets the, where it joins the cavernous sinus. The medial pterygoid wedge or medial pterygoid plates are landmark for that. And then finally, the horizontal petrous segment, the vidian nerve, remember, crosses lateral to frame and lacerum to go out across the horizontal segment. And then the ascending or peripharyngeal carotid artery, the landmark for that's the eustachian tube. Petrous apex is a very accessible area just behind the paraclival carotid artery if we understand these landmarks. The um, classic case is a petrous apex cholesterol granuloma, which you can see here. And simply by opening behind the paraclival carotid artery, I don't even have to skeletonize that artery. I can completely drain the contents. And what we've gone to now is placing a mini flap, which after, uh, with this mini flap technique, we have yet to have a recurrence. So this has been very effective. Um, I think that cholesterol granuloma is not a tumor per se. So if we convert this to an open, uh, non-occluded space, that's a much more effective treatment of this. And you do not have to do a radical resection, which has been the traditional approach through a middle fossa because you're not able to marsupialize the lesion. Here you can see a beautiful post-op scan showing that marsupialization where it essentially becomes part of the sinus rather than being a trapped and inspissated cavity, it's now part of the uh, nasopharynx or the sphenoid sinus. We found now about 32 cases of cholesterol granuloma. Here you can see one that's had multiple recurrences um, just uh, being treated from middle fossa or infracochlear approaches and here we are working just below frame and lacerum. We've drilled out the clivus. We've done uh, this uh, medial approach to the, ter uh, to the petrous apex. Here we're actually removing the stent that was placed from above that didn't help to uh, preserve the patency of this. And just by providing a wide margin here, and of course, because prior surgery, there's CSF leakage into the area. You can see, we can see all the way out into the cholesterol granuloma. I do not, and we can see middle fossa dura here. I do not feel it necessary 
to strip all these contents. We just place a flap over that and it's able to uh, stay patent. Here you can see that really the only complications were very minor and most patients had complete resolution of their symptoms. We had no carotid artery injuries and relatively short length of stay for what can be a very complicated pathology. When you compare this to the large Brackman series using uh, open approaches, we're able to have a similar or lower recurrence rate uh, and good relief of symptoms with only very minor complications. You can see here uh, facial nerve palsy, hearing loss is a very clear comp potential complication of the infracochlear approach. When we start talking about the medial petrous apex, like any uh, approach to the petrous, we can have a triangle that gives us access to it. And this is the triangle that I use. This is the triangle I think that gives us the most clear access. And these are the landmarks uh, for it. It's uh, the sixth nerve as it enters Dorello's canal, the paraclival carotid artery, and the petroclival synchondrosis. This is our window into the petrous apex from a medial approach. The petroclival junction just below this, tumors like chondrosarcoma often bulge up from the petroclival synchondrosis into the petrous apex. Uh, so this is an excellent um, way to access them through a medial approach. That's purely extradural, doesn't require any temporal lobe retraction. Here we can see a classic chondrosarcoma. We've, here's the cella, we've drilled out the clival bone. And here's that, that uh, widened window. So these tumors actually widen the medial petrous triangle. So the sixth nerve is pushed up by a cholesterol granuloma. Here you see Dorello's canal. The paraclival carotid artery is pushed forward, and these are originating from the inferior base of the, of the triangle, which is the petroclival synchondrosis. So working through this widened triangle, uh, this medial petrous apex, maybe accessing a little bit lateral to the carotid artery where a tumor has uh, pushed the artery posteriorly, we can have access through Meckel's cave. I can get a complete resection and really a very radical resection of this tumor. Here you can see uh, how this has pushed Meckel's cave laterally and separated, pushed uh, um, the carotid artery anteriorly. And I can even remove bone of the petrous apex, work with an angled endoscope to make sure I peel this tumor out from behind Dorello's canal. And you can really see beautifully this triangle. Now this obviously is requiring a fair amount of manipulation of the carotid artery, which has some very clear risk to it. And I'll talk in a little bit about how we can avoid some of that manipulation. Here we're resecting all involved bone, all involved dura for a radical resection of this chondrosarcoma, which in my experience prevents recurrence without any other treatment. Here's our final defect. And here's our final imaging showing a complete resection of the tumor, including a large portion of the petrous apex and the petrous body. I think I'll skip this in the interest of time. Uh, here you can see uh, our ser uh, a portion of our series on chondrosarcomas. Of course, some of these still do require open approaches. These are very complementary with, for example, a far lateral or an open transpetrosal approach, able to achieve gross total resection in 63% of patients and near total resection in the rest, with the lateral access being sometimes an issue. And I'll discuss that again in a minute, how we've uh, discovered a new way to get more lateral and get a more complete resection. Petroclival meningiomas are another classic petrous and, and uh, uh, middle fossa extension from a, uh, a posterior fossa tumor. And uh, one of the ways we gain access to these to widen that window with above the sixth nerve and, and around the sixth nerve is to do a posterior clinoidectomy through a pituitary transposition. So here we can see that the pituitary transposition being done. We're peeling out the posterior clinoids and the dorsum cellae. And when we do that, we have beautiful access all the way from the third nerve down to the sixth nerve. So great access to this medial aspect of, of uh, the middle fossa and the, and the cavernous sinus. Here's an example of a very large tumor. And admittedly, this is a, a largely clival tumor. This is a middle-aged man who presented actually with an NPH type picture and some severe imbalance. You can see the size of the tumor, but also the extension out into the, towards the post uh, petrous area. There's also a fair amount of bony involvement, which makes a ventral approach very, uh, very uh, ideal for this. I'll skip this initial midline exposure, but suffice it to say we did um, as radical of a clivectomy as possible. But here you can see, we've really drilled out this petrous triangle window here. 
Here's the sixth nerve in Duralo's canal. Here's the petroclival synchondrosis and the paraclival carotid artery. By drilling out that petrous triangle, I can gain access and dissect this tumor really quite widely. We did internal debulking of the tumor. And a tumor like this is great to stage because it often uh, can be very challenging to do all of this in one day. It ends up being a very long surgery, much like any uh, combined petrosal approach would be. Here we're doing the pituitary transposition, identifying the sixth nerve on the left side. And then finally, we identify the sixth nerve on the right side, which is really winding through the tumor. You have to get a little bit lucky in a case like this because the sixth nerve is always variable and can be very challenging to access. But here we're working again through that medial petrous triangle behind the paraclival carotid artery, below the sixth nerve, above the petroclival synchondrosis in order to gain access into this petrous portion of the tumor. We do an ICG run at the end to make sure all our perforators are open and then uh, able to get really very nice resection uh, and a nice decompression uh, of this tumor for this guy. Here you can see the post-op there, of course, is a small residual right up at the petrous apex, lateral to the nerves, but uh, widely decompressed as brainstem. And we'll observe that portion for now. Uh, it could be treated either with radiosurgery or uh, an open approach in the future. When we compared this, um, we really found that tumors medial uh, to the uh, trigeminal nerve were ideal for uh, endonasal approach. But of course, uh, if it's more lateral, then an RMC is a great option as well. And our goal here in all of these really was just to get maximal decompression without causing harm. And for these very large tumors and petroclival tumors often, we make patients worse. But we found that even with very short-term follow-up, we'd improved all of our patients' uh, Karnofsky score, which really is my goal when I'm treating a petroclival meningioma. These are very indolent tumors, and we're very likely to harm a patient when we try to do a more radical resection. Again, I talked about uh, the issues with working around the carotid artery, and this is our main source of morbidity and the main issue that we have and the main struggle we have is avoiding injury to the carotid artery. These are, again, my landmarks for that. Here's an example of working in the petrous apex. Here's a chordoma patient. And we can see here this tumor extending into the petrous apex. You can also see we had not done our transterygoid, our transmaxillary approach yet. So I left the room for a bit. My ENT partner, Dr. Schneiderman, did a wide maxillary antrostomy. But when I came back in and I started trying to work here at the petroclival junction, I was disoriented. And I ended up taking a bite out of the paraclival carotid artery. Now, because of the size of the tumor, we actually had proximal control in the neck, which was necessary. You can see this as a child. So we placed a clip in the neck. There was good back bleeding, and he survived a hypotensive challenge. So I just went ahead and sacrificed this artery. But the truth is, I didn't have great access to the petrous carotid artery. And trying to work around it like I did ended up with a very significant injury. And you can see I could have maybe packed this off with muscle and hoped and prayed that my endovascular colleagues could have done some sort of salvage. But really what I had to do here was just sacrifice it. This was a child. He tolerated it very well. He actually had a persistent trigeminal artery and great cross fill from the other side. So we got very lucky here and had no consequence of this. So how do we deal with this? How do we avoid doing so much, uh, so much carotid uh, manipulation and, and so much potential carotid injury? Well, this is a, a new concept, relatively new. We published it in 2018 uh, from the mind of Carl Snyderman. Uh, it's a contralateral transmaxillary approach. So by working from the opposite side, maxillary sinus, it actually turns out that this trajectory is beautifully in line behind the carotid artery. So you look here uh, on this top image, this transnasal trajectory really barely gets us behind the, para, uh, the petrous carotid artery. But the contralateral transmaxillary trajectory is almost parallel to the petrous carotid artery. This gives us beautiful access through that medial petrous triangle to gain access all the way much more lateral into the petrous apex. So we've started using this really quite regularly for uh, petrous tumors. Here you can see even this uh, chondrosarcoma that extends out towards Meckel's cave, we can access behind the carotid artery. Remember, these are largely paramedium or midline tumors that extend laterally. So by being able to uh, work uh, through that medial corridor, we avoid manipulation of anything that's not involved simply by following the tumor corridor. 
is another chondrosarcoma extending way down into the jugular tubercle and out to the IAC. And we're able to get all the way out to the IAC by following this corridor. So we have to do the same maxillary antrostomy, not only on the side of the tumor, but also on the side of the contralateral transmaxillary approach. We place our flap on the side of the CTM so the side opposite the tumor, because it keeps it out of the way of the tumor. But you do have to be careful with the flap when you're working through the CTM approach. Here's the trans approach on the side of the tumor. Again, we coagulate and we form a single cavity out of the sphenoid and the maxillary sinus. Here's just doing our flap and reverse flap. And now we can see here's the sphenoid. You can see both maxillary sinuses are open. So here I'm drilling out the vidian nerve on the right side, the side of the tumor. We drill out the whole clivus. Here's doing that front door to Meckel's cave approach and exposure of uh, the trans approach on the right side to detach the eustachian tube in order to gain access to that petroclival synchondrosis. And then I do still skeletonize the paraclival carotid artery, but you'll see we don't really have to manipulate it like I did in that earlier video. Here I can mobilize frame and lacerum. And now working through, uh, placing the endoscope in through the nostril and placing my instruments in through the contralateral transmaxillary, this is looking laterally. Here's the horizontal petrous carotid. And you can see how my instruments are coming directly parallel to that horizontal petrous carotid. I can get all the way up to Meckel's cave here to the right and all the way down to the jugular frame and here below. So beautiful access through uh, to really the entire petrous uh, bone and entire petrous apex. And it turns out this gives us better access to the base of the petrous bone uh, than an open approach, but we do not, an open approach is probably superior for the petrous apex. Here's resecting all the way down to the jugular tubercle and jugular foramen. Here you can see we're all the way out to the jugular foramen, and then we just fill that in with some fat. Just to go back, just to demonstrate how that corridor is being introduced. Here's our instrument. You see the instrument coming in through the sublabial incision right there. So all three instruments working at the same time. And here we're able to get a radical resection of this tumor all the way out to the IEC and all the way out to the jugular tubercle. Multiple different kinds of tumors we use this for and have found it really very, very useful. We looked at our first 29 cases with this. This is largely tumors like chordomas and chondrosarcomas and found that actually able to get 73% resection of the petrous portion of these tumors, gross total resection. And that's even when they extend all the way out into the petrous apex. So this really become a workhorse for this petrous tumors, avoid carotid manipulation, avoid carotid injury, and get a much more radical resection. When we start working in the petrous apex, of course, naturally, we know there are some excellent approaches uh, to the petrous apex. So we did a volumetric study. I have to credit Dr. Uh, Hernandez, who did this study, looking at uh, the petrous bone and the petrous apex access using a traditional anterior petrosectomy, a, a Hakuba quasi doling type approach, and comparing that to endonasal and a CTM approach. We did this by doing CT scans before and after the dissection in the cadaver lab on 10 different cadavers and compared it, the volumetric analysis using this technique that was previously published to look at 3D reconstructions of the bone. And you can see here the amount of the petrous apex. Clearly the Hakuba dolenk is the standard for the petrous apex. And only when we add the CTM do we get a similar degree of resection. But when you look at the petrous body, so the more inferior aspect of the petrous bone, the endonasal approach and the Hakuba dolenk are really very similar, but the contralateral transmaxillary provides a much superior access to the petrous body. So it's very nice because I think it shows how these are, are very complementary approaches, but the CTM really provides probably the widest approach to everything from the petrous body up to the petrous apex. So this minimizes complex maneuvers like the carotid mobilization or having to transect the eustachian tube. And so I think it's very similar access to a classic open anterior petrosectomy for the petrous apex. But when we're talking about the petrous body, it's actually superior access. So really something to consider for some of these clival tumors that extend out into the petrous bone. Again, reconstruction is critical. 
You really have to always place the nasal septal flap on the side opposite of the transpterygoid approach, or you'll uh, uh, risk your flap pedicle. So this can definitely be an issue. Well, what do you do in a patient like this who has bilateral uh, transpterygoid access? Well, what we do here is we mobilize the flap pedicle all the way out in the maxillary sinus. This do does put the flap pedicle at risk, but you can see here a nice enhancing flat pedicle covering the petrous apex on that right side where the tumor was resected. Of course, these coronal plane approaches, the level five approaches at our institution were never attempted even for the first multiple years. And only more recently have we started to do these more complex cases. We propose different training levels where these coronal plane approaches that require vascular dissection are considered level five cases and level four. And you can see how the complication the length of surgery, the blood loss, other complications go up dramatically with these level four and five cases. This is a very real uh, concern and there's a very significant learning curve with approaching these cases safely. So I do think that endoscopic endonasal or trans sinus surgeries can be used successfully all the way out to the petrous apex, middle fossa, Meckel's cave and infratemporal fossa. You really have to understand the carotid artery anatomy, what the involvement is, and control of the artery are critical factors because we are crossing the carotid artery no matter what when we do these coronal plane approaches. And there's a very significant learning curve, not only with dealing with the carotid artery, but with technical and anatomical aspects of the approach. Again, these approaches I think are very complementary, and it's great to understand not only when is it best to access them, but where you are in your learning curve to know which approach is best. I want to invite everyone as always to join this free educational website, the Skull-Based Congress, really designed as a Skull-Based community. And then this is a new book that's coming out that many of the speakers you hear today are involved with uh, production of. And hopefully see everyone in Pittsburgh sometime soon if we can start courses up again and hopefully see uh, my friends on this panel again at courses both in the US as well as internationally. Thanks again for this uh, wonderful invitation for a fantastic session. Thank you, Paul. As usual, a great presentation. Um, I have no question, but uh, just I uh, want to add some comments. Um, I would say that thanks to this uh, endonasal skull based approach, uh, today we can avoid the uh, uh, transfacial approach, more invasive, uh, uh, which requires uh, left heart maxillectomy. Uh, which uh, was the gold standard until 20 years ago. So today, most of these transfacial approach are uh, no more required for uh, uh, midline or paramedian uh, uh, skull base uh, uh, tumor, especially when we have to deal with the uh, uh, bone disease like ordoma or chondrosarcoma, but even uh, uh, for uh, other disease like uh, some selected true germinal schwannoma or even uh, uh, meningioma. Of course, when uh, we have to deal with uh, complex cell based meningioma like uh, clival or uh, petroclival uh, meningioma, uh, we have to compare uh, our perspective uh, and another perspective with the transcranial perspective because it's uh, a critical the case selection uh, for this uh, disease, which of course are uh, not the easy either. Uh, transcranially. So I'm eager to know the opinion of the two senior neurosurgeons which are here with us, uh, Dr. Uh, Atul Goel and uh, Chandra Shekhar de Pujari. Please, Dr. Goel, what's yeah. your opinion about this uh, skull base approach for uh, meningioma, especially for uh, clival or petroclival meningioma? First of all, I must congratulate Paul for this wonderful, wonderful presentation. There is no question that uh, the group in Pittsburgh has been instrumental in pushing the envelope and the envelope has been pushed a little bit too far ahead. <laughs> that is my issue. Now, one or two things. You see, there is no question, Paul, fantastic presentation. One is, uh, you know, whether this approach is suitable for chordomas, absolutely agreed. And in chordomas, I will also like to mention to you, you mentioned about the Gardner triangle and where you mentioned that the carotid arteries displays anteriorly, 
and the sixth nerve is displaced superiorly, effectively widening the Gardner's triangle. So you must know that both these shifting, like carotid artery shifting was described by me in 1995, like chordomas always displaced the carotid artery anteriorly. And chordomas always displaced the sixth nerve superiorly. This was described by me about two years ago. So these completely agreed that with this widening of the Gardner's triangle, the approach that you are mentioning is quite, uh, you know, viable and beautiful. As regards the use of this approach for trigeminal neuronomas, I must say that uh, what you have done is absolutely wonderful, but I don't really think that this is a good approach, transnasal approach for even V3 trigeminal neuronomas, because you know what, one of these cases you showed the carotid artery being in picture and all those things. You see, when you come, the trigeminal nerve is located in the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. I am wondering why you have to even come in vicinity of the internal carotid artery and the sixth nerve when you can come laterally. And it is such a straightforward lateral approach for trigeminal neuronomas. And you know that this is a trigeminal neuronoma. I, I, I am very happy to see you operating, but I don't think it is really a viable and a better option than a transcranial route. As regards meningioma, you have shown some quite a large series. And of course, what you have shown is what you have done and you have shown some fantastic outcomes and results. And you know, only a master like you can do and maybe in future many people take up. But as far as I'm concerned, being a lot, uh, involved in skull-based surgery for nearly 40 years now, I have a feeling that transcranial route is better in terms of safety, in terms of resectability, and in terms of outcome in not only laterally placed, even midline placed pitrocliaval and clival meningioma. This is my view. As regards cholesterol granuloma, no question your transnasal approach is better. So these are few comments, Paul. In short, I will say you have been trying to push the envelope very far and very wide and very beautifully for the whole world to see. But my feeling is that, uh, you know, some of these pathologies may not be the best option. Like trigeminal neuronoma, absolutely, I don't think it is necessary. Even pitrocliaval or clival cavernous meningioma that you did I don't really think it is necessary. And maybe uh, necessary, maybe okay, but it is not better. So what are your thoughts on what I have said, Paul? I, I uh, agree completely that um, I don't think for these lesions that one approach is better than the other. I think that um, it depends on, for especially for trigeminal schwannomas, I think there are very equivalent. In fact, in many cases, an open approach is superior. But I think for the tumors that really involve V3, I think that uh, it's very, it's much more difficult to get some of that infratemporal fossa approach without a larger approach. There is morbidity for each approach. An open approach to a trigeminal schwannoma inevitably has potential morbidity to the temporal lobe. And I think as neurosurgeons that we often ignore this, even if I don't use a retractor, if I do a lateral orbitotomy approach by disconnecting the temporal lobe from its venous drainage, sometimes you get a, a venous infarct of the anterior temporal lobe. So there is morbidity to the temporal lobe that an endonasal approach simply doesn't have. I would say that's probably the only advantage uh, for an endonasal approach. We don't know ever with a trigeminal schwannoma, the relationship of the nerve fibers to the tumor itself. So it's very difficult to say, you know, if you're approaching it relative to the nerve or not, if a medial or a lateral approach is better. But I, I agree for V2 or V1 schwannoma, it's not a better approach. For V3, I think it's an option. Uh, for petrocliable meningiomas, I think these are very variable. I think that um, there was a very good question uh, from the audience also, you know, how do you select for a petrocliable meningioma? And this is uh, kind of the concept is it depends on where the majority of the tumor is. 
If the majority of the tumor is medial to the cranial nerves, and generally petroclavial meningiomas by definition are, then I would choose an endonasal approach first. The truth is that there, for a, petri a true petroclavial meningioma, there is no single approach that gives you access to the tumor without having to move or cross nerves. And so in my opinion, usually some combination of approach for a significant tumor like this is best. If I do an open transpetrosal approach, which I often do for petroclavial meningiomas, I can't get to the tumor easily that is medial to the fifth nerve. I can't get to the tumor that is inferior to the IAC. So I, there are areas that are, I can't get to the tumor that is medial and superior to the sixth nerve. So there are very clear areas of a petroclavial meningioma that are limited from a lateral approach. That clival portion of the tumor ends up being relatively blind. It's very difficult to get as radical of a removal from an anterior approach. From a, a combined petrosal approach, you have greater risk to certain nerves in that situation as well. So I think you have to be honest with yourself about your ability to do a certain approach and then also what the relationship is with that tumor. Many of these tumors, in my opinion, cannot be approached with a single approach, but rather require multiple approaches, maybe done over a long period of time. So if a patient has significant brainstem compression so that the midline portion of the tumor is the most symptomatic portion, then I would do an open approach first. I would do rather an endonasal approach first. So I debulk the clival portion knowing very well that I'm not going to get the lateral part of the tumor and I'll come back and do that later in time. But you know, it depends on what your goal is. My goal with petroclival meningiomas is never the most radical resection possible with a single approach. I think that multiple approaches are usually necessary for those tumors. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Anyway, Paul, that was a no question. Uh, I wish you best. And I wish that you continue to do this kind of uh, path-breaking work and introduce for the whole world some fantastic this transnasal exposure. I'm not sure if anybody else in the world is doing this kind of work. I will like Shekhar Dev Pujari. Shekhar, what? Um, just you can. You, I will be happy to hear what you have to say. Well, what I would say is that, I mean, uh, it's fantastic work and I think very few people are doing it. And uh, one of the most important takeaway message of the last few slides as to when you should actually consider doing them. Uh, I think uh, that is one of the most important lessons that uh, uh, at what stage you start doing such procedures is equally important even for people who have uh, uh, skilled themselves to do endonasal endoscopic procedures. Uh, as far as what uh, we do is concerned, we are probably not doing so many meningiomas. We actually started doing quite a few meningiomas, the clavel as well as the uh, tuberculum cell meningiomas, uh, where again, uh, we have restricted uh, their use uh, to a very small percentage of cases. In terms of trigeminal schwannoma, the ones which we have uh, approached by this, have usually been residual cases which have been referred or recurrent cases for V3 schwannomas. While in chordomas, I must say it has become the primary approach. That is one indication where it has become a primary approach. And of course, corridor surgery, as uh, you know, described by uh, various other people, is important. What you can take out by chordoma, I'm I'm sure again. Paul has shown us very beautifully, even at your workshop uh, some years ago, that uh, uh, he, he can do a much better job, job in coronal plane. But I think for chordomas, basically, which are mainly midline, it has become a primary uh, procedure of choice. Paul, it was one of the super talks we have had in this ACNS uh, uh, webinar. What a wonderful talk. You talked about the triangle named after you, Gartner Triangle. You talk nicely about contralateral trans maxillary approach. You can come behind the fetus carotid. My, my question to you is, uh, how? what are your tricks for identifying uh, sixth nerve? Because, you know, tumor is there, chondrosarcoma. Is there any tricks for identifying sixth nerve during this surgery? That's a, 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 great, a great question. Um, 
uh, I wanted to say one other, you know, comment about the petroclival menium, which are the most challenging to identify the sixth nerve. Um, you know, Tool talked about chordomas and using them regularly for chordomas. Um, we didn't start doing petroclival meningiomas for 10 years. And even now, the complication rate for petroclival meningiomas is higher than other tumors. And so the advantage is lower because the complication rate is higher. So it's, a, it's definitely important to understand, you know, how these approaches fit um, depending on what the complication rates are and the difficulty with doing the tumor. And these are probably the most difficult thing that we do is petroclival meningiomas. The sixth nerve, um, I think the most important thing for extra um, dural tumors like a chordoma or a chondrosarcoma is exactly what Professor Goel has described and talked about. And that's understanding what the relationship is to the sixth nerve. A lot of times for chordoma, it can be very difficult though when the tumor displaces, it can even push the carotids away. I look for um, what's called the petrosal process. This is something Dr. Fernandez Miranda described, which is the very tip of the spike of bone of the medial petrus, right where it goes under Durello's canal. That's a great landmark for Durello's canal. Um, uh, that uh, I will use stimulation to identify the sixth nerve. But sometimes, even for a chordoma, if I think the inner layer of dura is involved, I'll open intradurally very early because I can always find the sixth nerve intradurally. The same is probably true for a petroclival meningioma. If I can find one sixth nerve and try to work back, remember the sixth nerve always starts at the vertebrobasilar junction and it's always at Dorello's canal. In between, especially with a petroclival meningioma, it could be anywhere. I have cut far more six nerves doing petroclival meningiomas than I care to even remember. I have one where the six nerve was pushed right up against the clival dura, and my first opening of the dura was right through the six nerve. So it's very unpredictable in these tumors. But chordomas and chondrosarcomas, I think it's much more predictable. And so understanding that relationship, I rely heavily on EMG stimulation, though, to, to try to localize the six nerve. That's a very, very good question. It's absolutely the highest risk thing from an endonasal approach, and it's something I still struggle with. My co-host, Liu Boon Seng. Uh, uh, thank you for a nice presentation, Professor Gartner. Uh, I wa wanted to ask you that regarding uh, the concept, because uh, in transcranial approach, we do have a classical approach to now we, we, we talk about a minimal invasive uh, uh, surgery. Uh, in your opinion, how, how about the uh, endonasal uh, approach, especially uh, extended approach, uh, whether such concept apply if you have some uh, philosophy uh, uh, concept behind it? And, and in what cases, especially in extended case, that you think that there is a need of a uh, bony reconstruction? Uh, because uh, some people talk about bony reconstruction and you never talk about it in your, in your presentation. And my last question is, if there is intradural or lesion that extend, extended intradurally, uh, do you always use lumbar drains? Thank you, Professor. Very good questions. Um, so I think one of the fallacies of endonasal surgery is that it's minimally invasive. It is not. It is a very invasive surgery. It is as big of a surgery, as big of an approach, as big of an exposure as any orbitozygomatic or transpetrosal can be. Now, of course, we try to minimize that. We change the corridor, we're selective about how much approach we do, and we are constantly working to minimize our morbidity. But there's no external incision, but inside it is a maximally invasive approach. It's merely a different corridor. I think that's very, very important to understand. Um, so we do use corridor concepts, I guess, is what we've taken from keyhole or minimally invasive, is understanding which sinuses do I open for which corridor you know, the maxillary, uh, the sphenoid maxillary corridor is our exposure for the middle fossa, for example. Um, uh, the second question uh, was, uh, I know the third one was okay. bony reconstruction. Yeah, yes. And in any case that you need a bony reconstruction. So the short answer is no. Um, we've never used it. Uh, we studied it pretty extensively. We looked at it on the anterior fossa and we found that patients get two to three millimeters of descent of the anterior fossa, but it's never symptomatic. The only area that I think needs some sort of buttress is the clivus. If you do a, a complete clival resection and resect the dura, 
we have about 17% of cases where the pons will herniate through. And Professor Goel has described this, I think, very nicely, is this is nature's way of trying to seal the hole. Um, but it, obviously, that's not ideal because you don't want the brainstem scarred against the clivus. It's never symptomatic. But what we found is that by actually buttressing the area between the paraclival carotid arteries with fat, so we put fascia and then fat, and then the flap on top of that, that prevents this herniation simply because there's something to buttress against the CSF pulsations. Finally, lumbar drain. We've done one of the few or, or only randomized controlled trials in skull based surgery, looking at lumbar drain during endonasal surgery. And we found that for large anterior fossa and posterior fossa clival defects, there was a dramatic difference, something like 30% to 8%. So for those, it's very necessary. But for pituitary tumors, and actually even for smaller openings like craniopharyngiomas or tuberculum meningiomas, it actually didn't seem to make a difference. And I think that's important because most people that do those kinds of tumors don't use lumbar drain and find it's not useful. And I think that fits with this data. And I think the reason is for a, a cellar or a supercellar defect, these are relatively small compared to these big clival or anterior craniofacial defects. In addition, they're right in sort of the sweet spot for the nasal septal flap. They're right in the middle of the flap. So the flap covers it widely. So there's much lower risk of leak with a nice flap in those locations. So I would say that for most tumors that most of us do, where we maybe extend up into the supercellar space, if not necessary, but for Y defects, it's critical. Thank you, Thank you so much. One last comment from my friend, Sachin Chimate, who is our co-host, Sachin. Oh, sir, I don't have any comment. Both were excellent talks. Uh, maybe one question uh, to Professor. Professor uh, Paul Gardner, as Dr. Uh, Professor Atul Goel said, that this is one of the extremes of application of uh, endoscopy in uh, uh, neurosurgery and skull based surgery. So, uh, Professor Paul Gardner, from the young neurosurgeon's point of view, like when do you or uh, how do you advise them which are the surgeries they should take first and how to go to the like these extremes of these cases, how, what is your take on message for that? It's a, an excellent question. Um, you know, Dr. Snyderman uh, wrote an excellent paper where he sort of described the training levels uh, for uh, this. And essentially it progresses from, uh, endo, uh, from simple sinus surgery uh, all the way up to uh, more complicated uh, approaches such as um, uh, even a clival tumor. But pituitary tumors, and um, even ex then extend to supercellar tumors are probably the way to approach it. So I would say most people should probably do at least 50 pituitary tumors before start doing any expanded approaches and then start doing things like very simple tuberculum meningiomas or maybe craniopharyngiomas to learn to do intradural dissection, avoid any vascular dissection. And then after even more experience, then you can start to decide if you want to do these more extended and more radical approaches. And it's not just the neurosurgeon, it's actually the whole team. So you have to have a neat, you know, your ability to work side by side with an ear, nose and throat surgeon doing these cases is very important. Uh, there, uh, you know, your team, you can maybe pull off the approach, but if your team can't pull it off, it's a real problem. So I think that you have to have uh, a whole team that can do these approaches together uh, to be able to successfully pull this off. Uh, I think that's I think that's very uh, important piece of this. Um, but I would refer to that uh, that lecture or that uh, paper that Dr. Schneiderman originally wrote, and we did a, a recent. I'm just trying to find his um, uh, classification team. Uh, here's an example of it. Um, uh, I think this is a very useful classification scene uh, for how you uh, go through learning uh, levels. And this is really the cutoff point. So doing transclival, even transodontoid approaches and pituitary surgery, I think most people will get that expertise. The real question is if you want to start doing intradural tumors like planar meningiomas, et cetera, and then maybe some of the more crazy things, it really requires a dedicated effort and a dedicated team. And it's a very clear cutoff point between this level three and level four surgeries 
where the complication rates go up dramatically and the difficulty of the surgery and the intradural microdissection is simply dramatically more challenging. So I think this is the important cutoff. And I would say that probably most neurosurgeons can get to the point where they do these level two and level three cases, but really need to think closely about whether or not they want to do level four cases as an endonasal approach. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much, much for this wonderful advice. It was really wonderful. Uh, we can go back to Professor Luigi Cavallo for his concluding remark. Okay, thank you. I think we are on time. Thanks again for your excellent uh, presentation and uh, nice discussion we had together. It's always good to have a uh, different opinion uh, and to share uh, our opinion on each other. So thank you. I think I have not uh, nothing else to say and uh, I can only thank you and really hope to see you, all of you, in real time next time and not only virtually, hopefully. Thank you so much. Professor Ohata is still with us. Professor Ohata. I'm, I'm I really enjoyed you. today's. I'm now back to the home. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank right. you very much for wonderful lecture, Professor Gaduna. And uh, I am uh, just a classical scholarly surgeon. Of course, my, my colleague, my uh, successor, Professor Goto, uh, very familiar to use uh, endoscope to the scalp surgery. But I think we must uh, select uh, the, the best approach tailored to individual patient. As far as my experience concerned, uh, in the meningioma, scalp meningioma surgery, endoscope is good for the decompression. We cannot uh, remove the tumor from the, the surrounding part of the dura attachment. In such kind of the tumor uh, radical, uh, surgical radicality, I still recommend to use uh, open skull base surgery. This is my comment. Thank you. Thank you so much. Both the lectures were fantastic. Professor Paul Gardner showed the extreme uh, use of endoscopy. This procedure should be regarded as Ozaki eight manuals, which are the extreme sports which were depicted in the movie Point Break. <laughs> So thank you so much. It was really mind-blowing lectures, both were, and we really enjoyed it. Uh, we were lucky to witness Professor Paul Gardner working live when he came here in Trivandrum, Kerala a few years back. Both your hosts at that time, Dr. Rajit R. and Dr. Vinod Felix were here. Professor Ajit R. is still here with us. Would you like to say something? Uh, Professor Gardner has shown that uh, endoscopy is going to replace the microscopic surgery in future. That is my uh, current concept regarding uh, use of endoscope. And actually, he has uh, rejuvenated our lives when he came to Trivandrum and conducted a workshop uh, that showed that many of the things that we thought we were never able to uh, resect wholly, he removed it and showed very wonderful uh, performance. I, I again thank you. Thank you for the lecture and thank you so much professor ajit so i'll wind this up officially uh, on behalf of the education committee of the acns and the president professor yoko kaito i would like to thank both the speakers for today professor henry Schroeder and professor paul gardner and both the chairs professor Luigi maria cavallo as well as professor kenji official thanks to all the leading neurosurgeons, Professor Atul Goyal, Professor uh, Suresh Nair, and Professor Chandrasekhar Diopojari, and all the other faculties who are joined from the rest of the world. Thank you so much for joining uh, Saturday. It is bye-bye from all of us.